our next session and I'm delighted to welcome Gabrielle Vice Carrington to the University for um, our symposium. Gabrielle is, as, as you know, um, Leonora's uh, elder son and is a distinguished academic, a professor of comparative literature, am I yes, right? Yes. In, in Mexico, um, a creative individual in his own right and someone who has also um, participated in, in creative work with, with his mother um, on some films um, as art director and on a, a book of writing, I believe? Yes. Yes. Well, these two and then sculpture as well and other things, yes. So he may talk more about that as we, we progress. Now, the, um, the kind of format for this session is uh, I don't want it to be I don't want to hog the conversation in any way. I want it to be a three-way conversation because I'm mindful of the, f of the fact that many of you here um, obviously have not met Gabrielle, be Gabrielle before. Uh, we'll probably have questions you may want to ask him about aspects of Leonora's work, which may be to do with your own research, your own writing, uh, and your own general interests in the work of Leonora Carrington. So while we talk, I'm looking for interventions from you. Uh, there's a microphone at the back. I just need you to put your hand up if you want to ask a question. And then you can get the question to Gabrielle. And so it's a three-way conversation. As much interaction from you, because I don't know when you'll get the chance to be in a conversation with Gabrielle again. Unless you go to Mexico, perhaps. <laughs> the first question I just want to get Gabrielle talking about is, is something of the role that he's involved with uh, in Mexico City with... A fundacion Leonor Carrington that he's the executive director of and its work and its ambitions and also something about what was recently done in April um, on the exact centennial day um, for Leonora Carrington. Well, first of all to thank you Roger for the invitation and, and the university and well yes you see the foundation was something that, that uh, began as, as a rather modest project. Uh, Danny, my son, was involved in it, and Patty, my wife, uh, who's not here, was also involved. Uh, I mean, involved in a way that it's impossible to describe because there was a lot of work uh, coming into the whole process. So, so Danny worked with me very closely in this curating of uh, the first kind of archival exhibition that was done uh, about Leonora and so on and, and around, around her, not only her writing but also uh, theater and painting and carpets and so on. So it, it was sort of a very ambitious project and fortunately enough, uh, we're about to finish. No? So, uh, yes, it, 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 had, it entailed an enormous amount of effort. Now the foundation wants uh, to help scholars and other people that are interested in Leonora's work, you know, be it artists or scholars or whatever, or whoever, and they can come to us and somehow I hope we can, we can help. You know? Most of the times we've been well, modestly successful, I hope. Okay, <laughs> well, you being one of the examples. So, so uh, yes, th this is more or less what the foundation does, and uh, we're trying to n not only to to inform people about Leonora's work, but also to have a, a bit more of a, an intimate you know, approach to her work, because uh, most of the time when it's this kind of very academic uh, uh, encounter with her work, it, it's uh, distant. Uh, I don't say that every time it's going to be like that, because we've heard some very interesting papers today, and uh, I, I, I was really astonished by by the intelligence and precision of each one of these approaches. Thank you. Have I got an intervention yet? Um, any questions anyone wants to start with? 
Ah, uh, one there, sorry, yeah. One there? Thank you. I would like to ask you whether um, you have been collecting in the Fundación a lot of um, correspondences by Leonora. And then one question I would like to ask you as a scholar, because um, I know that you are, you've also written or worked on surrealism, uh, and how far your mother's um, yeah, influence or presence in your life <laughs> um, uh, has influenced you in your scholar work. And then my third question would be, how could the French manuscript of Down Below get lost? <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that uh, about the kind of, I'll start with the influence, if you want. Uh, now, influence is a very uh, strange, what could we call it, bitch? <laughs> uh, or, or a dog, or a monkey. Uh, it can go all sorts of places, you know. So, yes, my mother had an enormous influence because well, I was born with a rat. So it's impossible not to have influence. I mean, you know, uh, she painted a mural in, in, in the nursery room. Well, we didn't have her in the nursery room. I, this belonged more to her infancy than mine. We had a room, mm -hmm. and that room had a mural. And that mural was extraordinary, but it disappeared, so it doesn't exist anymore. Somebody decided to paint over it, and that was it. It disappeared. But you see, it was there. But it was not only the mural. It was conversations. It was uh, watching her paint, watching her produce objects, and so on. That was that sort. And the other question, I'm sorry, there are too many questions. Um, the one on the correspondence. Oh, the correspondence. Uh, well, no, we have very few letters, actually. Very. Uh, she was not a very organized person, so most of the correspondence was lost. So now I'm trying to find Edward's correspondence with, with Leonor and so on. So I hope I'll be successful one day or other to receive some collaboration from scholars and so on that are working with Edward's things or that if they find correspondence, if I could share that correspondence. No, because yes, that's actually that's one of the weak points. No, that we've been struggling uh, a lot. No, and, and then about down below. Well, you see, the problem with down below was, uh, I suppose, first my bloody grandfather, no, uh, Mr. Harold. No? who obviously had something to do with your mother's uh, seclusion in this horrible mm. Santander. And of course, things got lost there. So I don't know. And, and, and afterwards, she rewrote the whole thing. But I think that the rewriting was very necessary, because the rewriting uh, worked as a kind of therapy for her. So it was extremely important that, and I don't think she kept notes, incidentally. Huh? Mm. I think she had an incredible mm, uh, mnemonic, you know, approach to everything. I, I think that most of Shakespeare she had memorized. So she did have an astounding memory. And I think that's what she used while rewriting uh, down the law. No? That's the story I can say, I can tell about, about down the law. Danny, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, just, to, just to complete on what the foundation does, part of it is uh, 
creating an archive, and I know as many of you that are working on you know our stuff, like we are more than willing to share what we've collected. And you know, obviously, as my father already said, we'd love to have people be able to send us stuff that they find, so we can keep growing this collection. You know, in the benefit of everybody that's here. So I mean, if you ever want to contact us, you can either contact us through www leocarrington.com or www.fundacionleonoracarrington.org. And finally, we also do a lot of workshops with children and people with dementia to try and do some sort of art therapy. And we're, we keep on trying to make those programs, although funding is a bit limited and tight, so we do as best as we can. Yeah. There's one just behind, excuse me, just there. I was just going to ask if maybe you think, uh, following on this notion that my father might have had something to do with it, that he might even have been involved in some of the papers disappearing, because I remember when I was doing that, uh, the research on that bit of her life, I did go to the, to the registry office, and I found, I was mentioning it to someone, and they said it was interesting, I found a list of items that were, that documents that were kept there, Letters from Andrea Chemicals, um, uh, her rejection to going to Spain when he wanted her to go to Spain, her request for a new visa through a, a, the, the ambassador ignoring him. I mean, there were a list of very interesting documents, and when eventually I got very nervous, and they were all kept in a box, uh, box 87 it was in a section, and I got to the box, and the box was empty. There was nothing. There were, I, all I have is the list of documents that were supposed to be there, but they were not. And I don't know if you know if anyone might have been there, because it's very easy at the registry just to tamper with stuff, and if you have suspicions. Well, the only thing I can say about that is that I can't speak about the, the political, you know, uh, arrangement behind it. I can only speak about her uh, relationship to, to, to the father. A and, and it's always complex. I don't think there's a black and white because we can create this image of a villain but that's not altogether true. I mean, it's always complex. So you you have the the what would apparently be the, the awful father, no? But then you have the other side. After all, she named me Harold. That's my first name. So I hope it was not, you know, <laughs> <laughs> any sort of reflection on, on, on her dislike of, of her father. But you see, I, that's why I think it's, it's difficult to to tell a story that is going to be objective, because we're always taking sides, of course. No? And I, I did not want to leave this role no, without making this absolutely clear that uh, well, people are not that black and white. Uh, now, there's, an, there's um, a series of images that um, Gabrielle's put together, um, which I'll flick through. Uh, during the, the conversation, um, we probably won't get the ch you probably won't get the chance to see all of them, but this is this is the first one, and obviously, as we as you all know, it's Crooky Hall, and it's um, it's a, a, a gothic and rather um, despairing image uh, of a Lancastrian um, uh, well-heeled house of a particular period, and uh, s what what interests me particularly is is the way that some of the Lancastrian iconography, uh, architecture, landscape, um, animal life, etc., continues to be depicted throughout the work of Leonora Carrington over the years, which, which gave birth to our particular, um, possibly cheesy mantra of re-Lancastrianizing Leonora, because of some sense that her, her worth wasn't being reflected in <coughs> her home county. And we are only eight miles away here from where Leonora was born and brought up. And in fact, there are many Carringtons who still live in this area, some of whom we're in touch with. Um, and um, I, w one question that I'd like 
Gabby to maybe comment on is, is, um, is his sense of how that Lancastrian uh, imagination kept popping up through the, um, the other influences that came to bear in later years in Mexico for Leonora. Well, you see, the thing is that um, her leaving Europe was very traumatic. So uh, she always wanted to come back, always. This was something that, that would pop up in conversations continuously. Uh, the house in, in Mexico somehow <laughs> wanted to, to uh, repeat what her life in England was like. Uh, I mean, not, not with not like that. No. <laughs> you know, of, of, uh, of a Carrington residence, but uh, no, but, but the cup of tea and the, and the cookies and things that were coming from England that were brought by friends <coughs> and so on, and they always became like kind of icons on the table, you know, like sort of talismanic objects, <laughs> like the marmalade, like real marmalade, or the real Stilton, or this or that, you know? <laughs> so, or, or bubble and squeak for that matter <laughs> that she could actually make there and then, you know, but uh, yes, that's how it was, you know. That was uh, Lancashire over there. But, but in her paintings and in her work, um, the, uh, the green and verdant landscapes of, of Lancashire seem to recur. Well, no, but you, you were saying something that I thought was very, very interesting, and it did come out in one of the talks, I can't remember which exactly. But there was this uh, crooky hall that all Hazelwood, because you know she lived both yeah. places. So uh, that was very much a kind of inner house. It was not so much the external uh, characterization of the building, so much as a, as a building of her own uh, subjective house. No? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this came up several times, no? not, especially with, with Crookie. Mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. Not so much with Hazelwood, but, but with Crookie, it had this incredible imprint no, on, on, on her psychic life. Mm -hmm. And not so much that, but also the, the children's role was very important because it came up in Penelope, that was one of the, one of the plays. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the recreation of the horse and so on. I remember that somebody was, was, was speaking about the horse as well, or the horses. And yes, but the rocking horse mm -hmm. was very important. And it was very important because Max had a rocking horse and he gave it to Leonora. Max, uh, so Max Ernst. Oh, Max Ernst, uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, Yes, there was that link with the horse and with real horses mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, she adored horses, that's true. But there was a very peculiar kind of uh, interaction between her infancy and the animal, especially mm -hmm. the horse, mm -hmm. no? in, in this case. No? Uh, can we, there's two questions on the same row there, and there's one over there, but there's two here. Thank you. Um, I would be very interested to know how you think your mother viewed André Breton, um, because people quite often talk about her moving to Mexico and gaining independence from the Surrealists, but I wonder, did she perhaps influence him as much as the Surrealists had influenced her early work? Well, let's not forget that, that Leonora left Europe, not because of André Breton, but because of the fascists, no? <laughs> And, uh, you know, there was always, you know, a very close friendship between André Breton and Leonora. They didn't coincide in the kind of femme objet or, or whatever that Breton had in mind, or, uh, or the femme enfant, uh, which my mother didn't play very well, or the muse, for that matter. She was not amused by that. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, no, she was a very, of course, as you could see, a very independent character. I think she, she was able to build her own kind of surrealism, and Breton respected that. So one should, you know, what I hoped you would Forgive say. him for some other of his... Uh, <laughs> 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 so, um, there's, pass it that way, sorry, that way. Thank you. I hope that you can hear me. Uh, I just, coming back to houses, is it true that this house in the south of, of France, where she spent, is it less than a year with Max Ma Ernst, is still pristine uh, as they left it? With, um, all the drawings inside and how they... Uh, I read that somewhere, but I don't know if it's true. Well, I hope so. Oh, um, really? Because but, but some of the drawings were stolen and so on. I thought it, it was a really horrible thing what the French did there. You know? But uh, yes, well, so let's sure. remember that it was fascist France, after all. You know? mm -hmm. it, it was not the actual France. No? And, uh, but uh, yes, some of the things are there. Well, Joanna might tell you a bit more about this because she was actually in Ardèche. Unfortunately, I've never been there. No? But I know that uh, there, are, there are a few things there, at least. No? Okay. Thank you. Okay, now there's one. Um, so just if you can. It's in green. At in green, yeah. That one, yeah. Um, Take the mic, please. So, Gabrielle, Take this was a question specifically for you. I'm sorry. I, I use this, I use this. So, um, I was lucky enough to hear you give, hear you talk when That's there was um, an ex uh, Leonora Carrington's exhibition at the Tate Liverpool a few years ago, and you gave a beautiful paper, like a, almost like a letter that you'd written to your mother. Um, um, I felt very much when you gave that, what I also felt when I first discovered her work was that it was as though she had been exiled from the UK. Like the division between her, her native country and the rest of her life was very, very strong. And I felt this in the, in the paper that you read and that in that exhibition happening in Liverpool at that time, that there was like a, that relationship between the UK and her starting to mend and all this stuff that's happening now and since then as being like a, bringing her back here. And I wondered for you personally, where that's got to. Do you feel like that relationship between your mother and your early life and the UK part of yourself has started to heal? Sorry, deep. <laughs> well, yes, I, I think that there is a connection and it's a connection that was, uh, was built by my mother, basically, because uh, when we were about, uh, I don't know, four or five years old, we did come to the UK and, and we stayed with, with my grandmother, Hazelwood, you know? Uh, I was even telling somebody that, that uh, her, her nanny was my nanny at the time, you know? So there was a very important link there because my mother arrived one day and, and she said, well, you know, we're going to Europe, just like that. <laughs> uh, so we stayed in Europe for quite some time. I was studying in France, no, in a very small little town uh, near the Côte d'Azur. But don't imagine it's a Côte d'Azur of luxuries and so on. It was a very old house and so on, very modest. Uh, and uh, we attended school with the rest of the, of the children, <laughs> no, of, of this little town in France. And the experience of, of uh, being in Europe it was <clears throat> so potent that it's impossible to, to explain to somebody that lives here. Mm -hmm. 
because somehow my mother uh, uh, gave us this uh, idea, or at least gave me the idea, of coming back. And coming back in a very peculiar way, you know? Not the kind of coming back that she experienced naturally, because the moment she came when we were uh, five and four years, it was to meet uh, Breton and, uh, and many of the other surrealists that were alive at the time. So, so, and Leonor Fini, of course, no? And so it was, it was a very strange kind of Europe. Remember, it's not today's Europe. No? <laughs> it was bad enough, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, it, Brexit. No, but at the time, you know, it was, it was the kind of Europe where it had the surrealists, no? Yeah. And, and it was very much alive, no? It, it, it was not Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, there's one there, and then there's one at the back. Um, way at the back, with your hand up. So, you're doing okay? You're doing great, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just have two short questions, um, and they're both sort of related to um, the first, I've never been able to read much about you and your mother's um, sort of experience of working on the set of The Mansion of Madness, so it would be wonderful to hear a little bit about that. And secondly, um, did your mother watch um, Jodorowsky's The Holy Mountain, and if so, what did she think of it? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> it's extremely amusing. No, <laughs> first of all, the, the uh, the film that we where we worked together. This is something that I told Roger when when we, I first met him. Yeah, the the, the Tate, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tate. That she was we, your apprentice. Uh, <laughs> so, well, somehow we worked together, but it was a somehow because we would discuss things, and then naturally I would have to improvise because there was nothing. <laughs> so I had to sort of. Uh, uh, gather, you know, animals, stuffed animals that belonged to a museum that had <laughs> been abandoned, no, a natural history museum. So I sort of tried to do as best as I could. <laughs> and then uh, that gave the kind of surrealist uh, uh, impression, which, which was <laughs> hilarious. As far as we were concerned, my mother and myself, we really did laugh about that a lot. You no, know, because it was, it was like 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 uh, being con artists. <laughs> <laughs> so we were both pretending, you know, that there was a film there, and actually we were doing everything against it. You no, know? so it was an anti-film. <laughs> and as far as Khodorovsky. Well, no, no, my mother never saw the, really? the sacred mountain. Uh, I don't think she missed a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, she did work with Alejandro yeah. in Penelope and in many other things. No, they were very good friends. But my mother was not very enthusiastic about watching, you know, films by, by Khodorovsky or, or anybody else, actually. <laughs> she liked uh, Hitchcock very much. Right? Yes. Well, very English films then. Yeah, oh, English films, yes. Yes, mystery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she, did, she does appear very briefly with Louis Bunuel in, in a film. That's yes. one of them. Yeah, she's a very brief cameo in that film. Yeah, uh, no, no, not that. Um, oh, the title forgets me at the moment. Um, um, but there, and there's, some, there's another appearance in a film as well. But I think there's two art direction credits she has. Um, what, with, with um, the maestro here. Um, uh, but let me pick up on the question at the back there. There's one at the back there. Hi, um, I am interested in the creative process. So I would like to know whether, because she, she did so much, she had so many roles, she was a painter, she was a writer, did she have a structure to the day? Did she write for a few hours a day, paint, etc., etc.? And how did she marry um, those th that role as an artist with that of being a mother? Well, uh, it was damn difficult. 
I'm speaking about the last question. You know, being a mother and an artist, well, you, some mothers here will understand that perfectly, how difficult that is. You know? But uh, about structure and about discipline, she had none. So <laughs> she would write whenever she wanted, and she painted whenever she she was inspired. So, you know, there was no structure, no, uh, you know, uh, uh, schedule, no, to follow. So, yes, about that. And then, as a, but I'm sorry, I missed the other thing that you were asking. Could you repeat that? No, that was it. Oh, oh. I hope I answered more than you. Know? Here. Yeah. Yes, I don't know if you can hear yeah. me. Uh, maybe we'll get the mic time. first because okay. it, it records it. Okay. Oh, thank you. Sorry. So I've got two questions. Uh, one is, since you mentioned, I'm interested in the relationship between Leonora and Leonor Fini, uh, because I know it was much softer, and it, I think it ties in with some ideas of collaboration. We were mentioning Remedio Svaro. I know that the one with Fini was much more suffered. And I also know that Leonora was writing actually uh, some letters to Fini before she actually had her mental breakdown as a form of explaining what was happening to her. So I think they had a very, very close relationship. You were mentioning then uh, Leonora at a um, later stage still being in contact with Fini. So I'm interested in that. And the second question is uh, Leonora as a feminist, I suppose, because I'm interested. Don't suppose. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. She was a feminist. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I have some ideas, some problems with the idea of feminism because I think that maybe she wouldn't really, I don't know, how will you define feminism? But yes, let's say Leonora is a feminist. So if she was involved in some form of activism, I know that she designed the poster for Mujeres Conciencia. I was wondering if she was speaking about uh, that at uh, yeah, a later stage in her life. Well, first of all, the relationship between uh, Leonor Fini and, uh, and my mother was, was very close, of course. And uh, the correspondence was mainly about Max Sands, because at the time, uh, you know that Max was incarcerated by the French, you know, first, by the Vichy government. A and then uh, the Germans also wanted to incarcerate him. So yes, th this was a very traumatic moment. Uh, as you know, they were living at first in, in Ardèche, and then she had to leave Ardèche, and so on. So and that was part of a breakdown and so on. So Leonor Fini, I think, was, was extremely important as a close friend and confidant. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how she managed to have this very special relationship with, with Leonor Fini. And with Remedios, it was, uh, I think, deeper because she lived nearby in Mexico. So we would visit her. And it was wonderful because it, she was always surrounded by cats. So I had very long conversations with cats. <laughs> now, all the cats were very interesting. While Leonora and, and Remedios gossiped. Okay. Uh, they didn't speak about art. That was a no. <laughs> I, I think Leonora never spoke about art if she could avoid it. No. And they spoke French between them. Sorry? They spoke in French in between them, or, or Spanish, or... Remedios? Remedios and No Spanish. Basically Spanish, but some French, yes, of course. She, she spoke French with my father. Well, I mean, my mother At home, yeah. spoke French with me. Yeah, I do think cats are interesting as well. And about her feminist commitment, let's say? As a, she was, yes, she was very much a feminist, and there was a moment when Mexico was very much in need of this. So one could say that the, the, the first uh, feminist movements were somehow inspired by, by Leonora in many ways. No? I mean, uh, sorry? 
the net. The net. Uh, yeah, well, my son is mentioning a whole demonstration where women wore black. This was during 68. So, yes, she was very much of, a, of an activist, but not so much uh, as a public figure, but more as, as a private person mm -hmm. that was trying to really change uh, conceptions about women. No? Definitely. So I was very grateful to her because I was, I hope, uh, I, I became a, a full blown feminist. Even feminist. One last question to go with in the, in the middle there. If, if you don't get the chance to ask, I get Gab, Gabriel's around for a bit longer, so you may be able to get a chance to have a question. Um, well, I was just wondering, I have two things. Um, one is the question, and the other one is Lucy. I can't hear you, I'm Could sorry. You, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes. Speak, speak directly <laughs> into well, it, yeah. I was wondering about, um, like Matt has been said about the relationship of the exiles that arrived in Mexico in the 1940s, and uh, between them and the Mexican artists, you know, and the muralists and, and all that. So I was wondering about how did Leonora feel about arriving to this kind of Mexico, which was obviously so different to surrealism and European art. And because obviously there's so many stories of the, uh, Rivera, Ridiculous, and, and Breton, and all these stories of not uh, <coughs> liking each other and things like that. So I was wondering how, how far is that truth, or how was even Leonora's art received that time there and and my second um, question which is easy is the pictures that you have here are they in the website thank you yes they are uh, i mean answering her uh, and about her relationship with with mexican artists at the time it was very conflicted because they were not very welcome no uh, no i'm not speaking about diego uh, but I am speaking about Segedos, for example, you know, who is a real monster. He stole one of the uh, projects for a mural and in order to paint it himself, you know, that sort of thing. And the murals had a very uh, negative attitude towards the surrealists. Uh, now, again, this is not a black and white story because you have Diego Rivera, and you have Trotsky, and you have uh, André Breton as well. You know, this kind of triangle. And, and, and Frida, of course, was, was involved in this kind of triangulation. To my surprise, she was considered a surrealist, no? Uh, Diego and Frida. I, I, not that I don't, I'm, I'm not, not that her work is uninteresting. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it's a very peculiar way of defining somebody's painting, no? Mm. Yeah, thank you. And how was, how was her art at the time when she arrived there um, uh, received in, in within that? Obviously she became, was it within time that her art was more understood, would you say? Was more, um, yeah, received or understood rather than at her arrival? People kind of warm up to well, how, can you say something about how it developed that relationship between her art and, and Mexico and how it changed maybe or? Well, the most important stage there was the Galeria de Arte Mexicano. Uh, they played a very important role, you know, uh, organizing exhibitions and so on of Leonora's. So that's the way that little by little people began to to familiarize themselves with, with my mother's work. And then, uh, well, after years and years and years, she became uh, a very well-known uh, uh, character. I mean, she, she was a very important, she had a great following in Mexico, and everybody was very enthusiastic. It's incredible. I mean. She became a kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, a fan kind of uh, uh, phenomenon, if you see my point. No? She's followed by many, many people, and 
it's quite different from from the UK, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where she was largely uh, ignored, ignored no, till now. Mm -hmm. So uh, the phenomenon was completely different. In Mexico, she was very well received by, by most people, no? Mm -hmm. But it took some time. It was not immediate. And she had to build this uh, taste for her art and, and what she was doing, no? It, it required an enormous amount of effort. It was very difficult. I think we're going to have to call this session to a, to a okay. halt now. And um, thank you all for your questions, which allowed a very interesting three-way conversation to take place. I'm sure you'd like to offer your appreciation to Gabby for answering the question.